A self-made millionaire named Eugene Land changed the lives of an entire sixth grade class when he was asked to go there and speak a word of inspiration to them. He asked himself, uh, what could he say to inspire these students, most of whom would drop out of school before graduating from high school? He had no idea how he can get these predominantly black and Puerto Rican children to even look at him. So scrapping his notes, he decided to speak to them from his heart. Stay in school, he admonished, and I'll help pay for the college tuition of every one of you. And at that moment, the lives of these students changed. For the first time, they had hope. Said one student, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. And nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate from high school. So this morning, we're picking up in in Mark chapter 5, and we're beginning in verse 21, and we're going to see the incredible power of hope. Jesus was bringing hope to a people, to a place, and to a world that desperately needed it, and he is still doing so today. The world desperately needs the hope of Christ. We don't need the the empty words of ideologies that have all been tried and failed. We need the truth of Jesus to permeate our lives, to permeate our hearts so that the root of our brokenness is healed as our hearts are brought back into right relationship with our Creator. It is by no other name that we're saved, but by the name of Jesus. And if we've, you know, learned nothing else from this pandemic, uh, we've learned again that in all of our technological developments, um, all of our improvements in research and in data and in vaccines and in cures for illnesses, there will always be another one. There's there's always going to be another disease, another storm, another tragedy, as if the earth is in this groaning pain and saying to us in our pride of heart that we are broken. And from dust we came, and to dust we will return. So is your hope this morning in the experts who don't seem to have the answers or in the politicians who, who say they have the answers but always it, it never seems to quite pan out? Or is it in Jesus, the one who came, the one whose word is true and eternal and he offers eternal salvation? And truly, it is a golden feeling to have the hope of Christ in our lives. Something to look forward to that cannot be stolen or taken away. You can, you can lose everything else in this life and still have that same hope in Christ because we know Jesus is the promise keeper. Jesus is the way maker and he holds the keys of death and Hades and he unlocks the way to eternal salvation. So we pursue him, we rest in him, we, we trust in him that he is the faithful one who has come and is coming again. He has come and he is coming again. And that is our great hope, that great day where we're looking to when he's coming again on the clouds in his glory to bring our final redemption. And when we pick up in verse 21 of Mark chapter 5, we get a small picture of what it will be like when Jesus is coming with the clouds, when he is crossing over again from the heavenly realm to our physical realm. It will be a little bit like in verse 21 when we read, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. So Jesus had come back from the other side of the lake. Remember last week, Jesus had gone to go and confront Legion, uh, that demonized man, to liberate him from the demons. And now Jesus is returning, and a great crowd gathered about him as he was beside the sea. It's as if people saw him while he was still a long ways off. And, 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 and the ones who were watching blew the horn, and people from the town said, Jesus is coming. He's coming back. And so they all gathered and met him on the shore as he is getting out of the boat. A great crowd gathered there. 
And there was one man who was pushing through all the rest, and the people started to make way for him as he was coming through. In verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, a leader in the area, Jairus by name. And seeing him, seeing Jesus, Jairus fell down at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Hope incarnate had come. And Jairus heard that Jesus had gotten off the boat and he immediately left the bedside of his beloved daughter who was, who was dying to find hope. And he fell down at his feet. And Jesus came with him. When he asked him to come and lay his hands on his daughter, he came with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about Jesus as the good king had returned, the one who brought healing and hope into the land. The people thronged about him and said, pressing in on him, getting as close as they could to the one who was bringing hope. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. 12 years, 12 years of sickness. A woman who was a social outcast. By by the law in Leviticus 15, she was considered unclean, suffering perpetual bleeding, meaning she could not go into the temple. And anyone who touched her bed or anything that she sat upon would also be ceremonially unclean until evening. In these days, she would have been a social outcast. And beyond that, be in pain and be in weakness from the bleeding and suffering for 12 years. Think about it. We're we're kind of complaining and getting real sick and tired of eight weeks of social distancing. Imagine 12 years of this being forced upon you because of an ailment that you could do nothing to fix. So even though you wanted to see others, they didn't want to see you. It's not like she could cheat for a day and go hang out with friends and family. No, she was known as her ailment. She was known for her ailment. She was the woman who bled. And for 12 years, she had to shelter in place. She had to self-isolate. She had to social distance. But verse 27, she had heard the reports about Jesus. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Hope incarnate had come. If I could just touch his garment, just the smallest piece, just the corner of his garment, I would be healed. See, wherever Jesus went, he brought hope. He made the impossible possible. And this woman, so used to being inconspicuous, keeping to the shadows and and hiding in the back, has now gotten the courage to pursue Jesus because he was bringing hope to those who had no hope. In verse 29, and immediately when she touched him, the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in around you and yet you say, who touched me? Come on, Jesus, don't embarrass us like this. People might think you're crazy, and then us, by extension, think we're crazy for following you. The disciples, man. If if nothing else, when you read the Gospels, uh, the disciples should also give you hope. Because if Jesus had patience with them, as they blundered their way through trying to follow him, he will have patience with you, too. And that's great news. These guys are pretty dense. But God in his patience and loving kindness teaches them, just as he teaches us as well. So Jesus felt power leave him 
to her, and he was being pressed upon by hundreds of people, but he felt a distinct grab and the flow of power from the hem of his cloak where, where this woman briefly caught hold of him. And he stops in his tracks, most certainly to the irritation of the father Jairus, who was desperately seeking to get his daughter healed, for she was on her deathbed, and also most certainly to the consternation of the woman who had hoped to remain unnoticed and, and inconspicuous, just, you know, secretly sneak in, grab hold, get healing, and then sneak out like a covert op. But Jesus wasn't going to allow that. Because 12 years of isolation can cause social interactions to be very difficult. But remember, the kingdom of God is a light. And what, what does Jesus say about a light? It, it's not meant to be put under a bed. It's not meant to be hidden. It's meant to be put on a stand, to be put on display as a beacon of hope for others. And so great was the light of Christ that people were coming out of the woodwork to seek him. The, those social outcasts, those the, uh, suffered from mental illness, the physically ill, the demonized, the Pharisee uh, synagogue leader who most likely despised and rejected Jesus initially becomes this desperate father to save his little, little girl. So he goes to the one that his colleagues, the other Pharisees, were plotting to kill. In the, middle of this, uh, in the middle of it all, this hurry to the home of Jairus, Jesus stops and calls out for the one who touched him. Calling out to the one who had become as a recluse, a clam that had kind of retreated into her shell. She would hardly come out for anything anymore, only to eat when absolutely necessary. And now Jesus is calling her out of her shell, coaxing her into public view. Who touched my garments? And he looked around to see who had done it. Verse 33. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. I love this interaction. Jairus was fighting for the care of his daughter. But the one who had not one person to care for her, who had no friends bringing Jesus to her or bringing her to Jesus, no one was making requests on her behalf. She had no influential father to, to fall and to beg at the feet of Jesus for him to come and heal his daughter. But she does have a heavenly father one who knew everything about her and who loved her and cared for her. And Jesus, in this moment, had to stop to take care of his daughter that everyone else overlooked, but he did not. And the one who would make a chair unclean just by sitting on it was cleansed through her faithful action of reaching out and touching Jesus. Because when we come to Jesus, he makes what was unclean, clean. Where before there was a barrier between us and God, our sin and uncleanness made us so we could not even enter his presence. See, in the wilderness with the Israelites, God dwelt with the Israelites through the tabernacle and later on through the temple. But in order to enter into the tabernacle, they had to become ceremonially cleansed and make atonement offerings for their sins. It was a process even then, but it was, it was temporary. It made it abundantly evident that there was a great need for something new to come for an atonement that would, that would be everlasting, that would be once and for all, that we all may be cleansed from unrighteousness and come back into right relationship with God. But we needed a mediator, and that mediator was Jesus. And in this moment, we see his power uh, to make clean what was once unclean. And that power resided in the very hem of his garment. She just caught hold of the smallest piece of fabric and her whole being was cleansed. And this is the kingdom of God being revealed on earth as it is in heaven. Hope for the nations, hope for the sick, for the widows, for the orphans, for the outcasts. Because he calls her his daughter. 
Jesus loves her in the same manner and with the same intensity that Jairus desperately loves his little girl. We might say in our, in our short-sightedness, man, that was rude to call her out and to, to make her come in fear and trembling and confess the whole truth. But Jesus is calling her out of her shell so that she could be reintroduced to society, so that the whole truth can come to light and she could be completely set free from her ailment. For her ailment was not just physical. It was mental. It was emotional. It was spiritual. She was broken, trying everything, costing her everything, and losing not only all of her finances, but her relationships through this. But she held on to one thing, her faith. She did not reject God for her suffering. She held on to faith and to hope. So when hope embodied came onto the scene, it was her faith in God that moved her feet to action. She did not curse Jesus for her suffering. She simply grabbed hold of him. She, she grabbed hold. She had no words left. She'd requested so many times to God. She was done using words. She just pushed her way through and grabbed hold of Jesus and immediately felt his healing power course through her body. The cooling salve of his healing touch. And I tell you, you can spiritually grab hold of Jesus today and experience his healing as he brings restoration to your very soul. He is seeking you and until you find him, you will not find peace. You will find peace in nothing else. It will always be fleeting, just out of reach, almost, but not quite, until you finally surrender to Jesus and say, I need you, I put my faith in you, and I rest in you. Please take care of everything else. And he has, and he will. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was speaking, while he was saying this to her, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble this teacher any further? But overhearing what they said while he was speaking to the woman, Jesus turned and said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. If you don't hear anything else this morning, hear Jesus saying to you, Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. The next time you're tossing and turning in, in anxiety, at night, hear the voice of Jesus saying, do not fear, only believe. Believe that Jesus is with you. The next time you, you fear the future, you fear the unknown, do not fear, only believe. Jesus is on the throne. Believe that the one who came is coming again as he said he would to right every wrong, to wipe every tear, and to heal our bodies and our land. Do not fear this temporary shaking. Do not fear this trouble, only believe in the eternal and the unshakable one. We see so clearly how much Jesus cares not only for his daughter that he healed of her bleeding, but also of his son, Jairus, who was at a breaking point just hearing the news that his daughter had passed away. He says, do not fear, Jairus, only believe. Verse 37, and he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So this was the inner circle of his disciples, those who were always there, whom Jesus specifically invited with him to the Mount of Transfiguration where, where they saw him in his full glory, who he truly was, and whom he invited into this home where they would come and witness him raise this girl from the dead. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Did you know that Jesus is willing to be publicly mocked and laughed at in order to love you. He's willing to take that upon himself in order to love you. He is, in this moment, he's protecting both the girl and the whole family, taking the weeping 
and the wailing and turning it into laughter at his seemingly ignorant comment. But he knew more than any of them that his words were in fact true. She had fallen asleep until the day of resurrection. As in the book of Acts, we see that those who die are referred to as those who have fallen asleep because they understood in Jesus there is resurrection. Our souls are eternal. We do not perish, but we live on. And when we die, it is a falling asleep until that day of resurrection. So he put all the people outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, and this is Aramaic, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. So one miracle after another with Jesus. And shortly after commanding the wind and the waves to be quiet and to be still, if you remember earlier from the chapter before, and the wind and the waves obeyed him. After freeing this demonized man from a legion of demons, Jesus now raises a girl from the dead because remember, he is the author of life. Okay, he can intervene in the story and make changes because he has authority to do so. So he tells this little girl who died to arise, and she does. All they saw was a corpse. But Jesus spoke to her very soul, which is eternal, and it returned to her body, and she was made alive again. So alive, indeed, that she needed something to eat because her physical body needed to restore its strength. So he tells them, get her something to eat to restore her strength. So this brings us to a couple closing observations from the text. First, the healing ministry of Jesus is the proof of his authority. So you say, how can we receive new and glorified bodies? Look at the healing ministry of Jesus. God shaped us from the dust of the earth and breathed life into us. Jesus healed all kinds of sicknesses. All who came to him uh, for healing were healed. And that is an eternal reality for us. Our great hope is in the ultimate healing and renewal of our bodies uh, that we will have no more aches and pains. No more sicknesses. We, we can run and jump and sing and dance for joy as much as we want. We can hug and kiss each other as much as we want because there's no more sicknesses. We're not going to be spreading any viruses in the new heaven and in the new earth. So if you're in pain today, look towards the ultimate healing, the new heaven and the new earth, and your new and glorified Body. If you are lonely, look towards the open arms of Jesus. If you're afraid, look towards the heavenly armies that stand at the ready to cast down the principalities and powers of this world on that day. So do not be afraid, only believe. Second closing observation is that the miracles themselves are amazing, but the story is about so much more than the miracles themselves. So two daughters healed. Two lives restored, one who suffered for 12 years, one whose life was cut short after 12 years. Their bodies and lives were completely restored in that same day. Jesus not only cared for their physical bodies, their physical needs, but also their social needs, loving them both fully and individually, bringing one out into the light and covering the other, asking one to share her testimony and covering the other by keeping her death and resurrection private. And through these two interactions, we see our eternal promise from Jesus, the spiritual reality of our cleansing from sin and his covering of us as we take upon us his righteousness. We take on his garments. And then also the spiritual reality of the resurrection from the dead, the bodily resurrection from the dead. When we look to Jesus, we are reminded that he came for so much more than temporary healing. A lot of ministries are built upon a temporary hope, a temporary healing, a temporary prosperity, your best life now. But Jesus came to bring eternal healing, physically, eternal restoration of relationships, and most notably is that of reconciliation between us 
and God. And next, restoration of relationships between one another. Which is why Zacchaeus, if you remember his story, upon encountering Jesus, repaid everyone fourfold, whoever he had wronged and cheated out of money, because he had made a right relationship with God through Jesus. He had been made right. And the next step was to make relationships right with one another, repaying them fourfold, everyone he had wronged. This is the healing that Jesus has brought to this world. And the, and the, the miraculous healings we do see that still happen points to this eternal reality as well. It's about a bigger picture than just the here and now. For this world is passing away, Jesus says. It's passing away. Our hope isn't in this world. It's in the coming one that he's bringing with him. Third observation, uh, by stopping to help the one, Jesus was not choosing one over the other. When Jesus is posed with the question, there's two women drowning, one's an older woman, one's a young girl, who are you going to save? You can only save one, Jesus. Who are you going to save? He's going to say, I'm going to save both of them. And they're like, no, no, you don't understand, Jesus. You can only save one of them. If you try to save both, all three of you are going to drown. He's like, I'm going to save both of them. It's like, it doesn't work that way. He says, nope, it does. Because what's impossible with man is possible with God. Okay, so yeah, it's impossible for you, but it's possible for God. It's possible for me. I'm going to save both of them. And the key feature here in this story for both of them was faith. Both the father and the woman put their faith in Jesus. They believed in him that he could heal. And even when the father received the horrible news of his daughter's passing, Jesus said to him, do not fear, only believe. Have faith. I am bringing salvation to your house as well. And finally, the last observation, the work of Jesus in us is not meant to be kept secret. It's not meant to be kept secret. Just as with the man possessed by the legion of demons, Brian spoke about last week, a man who had no hope, now had it because he had an encounter with Jesus. And, and the man wanted to get in the boat and go with Jesus. But what did Jesus tell him? He says, no, go and tell your people. Go and tell your oikos. That, word, that Greek word we've been talking about, your, your extended relational household, your friends and your family, those God has put in your life. Go and tell them all that I've done for you. Go and tell. It's not meant to be kept secret. Jesus called out the woman to bring to light what had happened, to to bring to light the healing that had taken place within her, that she would confess and give her testimony of what Jesus had done. And though he kept the resurrection of this little girl private initially, it was not meant to be kept private forever. It was meant to be brought to light put on a stand later as a witness and testimony to his power and to his authority, to his love and to his care, to his willingness to take on the laughter and the mockers on our behalf. And I wonder if we are willing to do the same for him. Jesus has said that we are his witnesses to the very ends of the earth. Don't allow your circumstances to limit you or to distract you. Jesus has called us to love as he has loved us. And we know that he gave his life for us as a ransom. May we give ourselves to love others in that same way. To love those who would rather remain hidden, to remain in the shadows, Because the only person that can bring them out is hope incarnate, the person of Jesus. And how will they know unless we tell them? And if that is you this morning, it is as simple as the ABCs we say. A being admit. Admit that you can't do it on your own. That you need a Savior. And B is for believe. Believe that Savior is Jesus. And C is for commit. Commit your life to following him. Commit your life to becoming a disciple, becoming a learner after Christ, to open up his word and and to read his commands to us and to say, how can I live more like Christ? How can I be more like you? And in the story, we see him loving the outcast, loving those who are afraid and saying, don't be afraid, but believe. 
How can we be more like Christ? Commit your life to following him. Would you please pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, that you would go so far to bring light to the world, to bring hope in the midst of despair. Jesus, we thank you that we can take great hope in you and that you are the faithful one who will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for willingly going to the cross to restore our relationship with you for all eternity. So God, I pray for any of those who are this morning committing their lives to following you. Lord, I pray that you would surround them with those who would encourage them and teach them along the way. And God, I pray that you would make yourself known to them and that they would know for a certainty that they are now your son, they are now your daughter, and you love them just as you love this, the woman and the little girl in this story, that you care for them individually in the way that you cared for these girls in this story. So Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your all-surpassing love. And Lord, we trust in you this morning for the rest of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.